Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be talking you through my Q1 favourites. So that is from January to March 2019. These are my top 10 favourite books. I'm not sure how many books I've read in this period, but it's got to be close to like 100. So it's it's, it's hard to get into the list, you know. Uh, I'll list below actually how many books I have read up, up to this point. But without further ado, let's get straight into it. So counting down. So in at number 10. We have Ruth Ball, Rebellious Spirits. So this is non-fiction, audacious tales of drinking on the wrong side of the law. I was actually sent this as a review copy over a year ago, never got round to it. And I was going to read it as like my bedtime book and I started reading it and I was enjoying it so much that I had just had to like switch it out as my main book. But yeah, really good stuff. Lots of great stories about like brewing, distillery, smuggling, all that kind of stuff. Mostly focusing on the UK. There is some stuff in terms of America when uh, prohibition was going on and how like UK suppliers kind of rose to fill that demand. And also lots of really great stories as well about kind of all of these people involved in the, the you know, the various trades of the, you know, the gin smugglers and also like the people on the side of the law. And yeah, it was just really interesting to read about all these historic people. Also, one thing I should note is that it has a load of recipes and it includes like the old historical recipe and like source from whatever book it was from and then like a newer modern version of the recipe that you can try at home as well. In at number nine, we have Death Note Black Edition Volume 1 and this contains Volumes 1 and 2 of the manga. It's by Tsugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata and basically I think I would have enjoyed this more but I've seen the Japanese movies and the American movie that was on Netflix so I'm kind of pretty familiar with the story there were some bits I'd forgotten that still took me by surprise and overall the storytelling was great but I was just hampered it I didn't quite give it a five out of five because of that fact just because from my own experience I knew what was coming but definitely I would suggest reading it. it's my first time reading manga as well I have read a fair few graphic novels but I'm really enjoying it. I'm actually currently up to uh, number three in the series. So don't be surprised if you see some of these in uh, my next favourites video. In at number eight, we have A Blink of the Screen by Terry Pratchett. This is collected shorter fiction. A lot of this was published uh, in the Books Free Press, which is my no local newspaper here because he, he lived down the road. And this basically has like 50 years worth of Pratchett's career in all of these previously unpublished sort of short stories. Actually, I think some of it has been published, but in like weird places. So I'd never come across any of it before. And as well as having a load of non-Discworld stuff, we also have some uh, early Discworld, we have some spin-offs, some stuff that never quite made it, you know, some early ideas. We have some early drafts of the work he did on the Long War series with Stephen Baxter. We have some early Gnome stuff. So yeah, for like a Pratchett aficionado, this is uh, definitely worth reading. At number seven, we have an indie book, and that is Film It Cuts, Sunshine and Lollipops by Ollie Jacobs. So this does have some downsides. It has like some weird formatting and occasional typos and grammar mistakes. But I was able to look past that just because of the qualities of the stories. I mean, this is now nearly two months since I read this and I remember a lot of them vividly. I remember the first story, which was about a blogger who basically becomes a zombie, hence the uh, cover of this. And then we, we find out what happens to them as they kind of learn to deal with being a zombie. We have a great story about a teacher who makes a deal with a devil and uh, basically he gets this room that he can punish kids he puts them in there for five seconds and they can't come out kind of changed and no longer bad but if he leaves them in for more than five seconds bad things happen and guess what happens obviously he forgets and leaves somebody in there so yeah there are loads of great stories in this and um i would definitely recommend it yeah especially if you want to support indies in at number six we have the miniaturist by jesse burton so i actually read this as a buddy read with anthony andrews anthony got i think about a third of the way through and dnf'd it um but i can see why like it's not a book that everybody would enjoy i personally really did enjoy it partly because it's set in amsterdam it's also historical fiction which like, i don't read enough of i i do enjoy it as a genre when i do read it so it's kind of like a treat when i do read it it had kind of elements of romance in it but it wasn't overpowering also so it had some interesting sort of themes such as like homosexuality when it was illegal, uh, you know, the reputation of a young woman when she becomes pregnant, especially by a black man, all this kind of stuff. And uh, I also appreciated like it, it did sort of slow down at parts, but it was broken into different sort of sections and something big always happened at the end of each section that made me then want to keep reading the following sections, you know. Okay, in at number five, we have a classic. We have Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. And I think one of the reasons why this is so high up in the list is because I had such low expectations going into it. I did also have this great uh, version here, which has got illustrations in it. I want to find the one where the guy gets shot in the face because that one, that just made me laugh. The mate shot the new captain through the head. Very nice, very nice. 
So my problems with this, the start and the end of it were kind of weak. It should have ended as he was getting off the island when it kind of continued for three more chapters with no real purpose to them and then just ended at this really random point. And I didn't really care for the opening chapters just because I wanted him to get to the island, but I think they were necessary, more necessary than the ending chapters anyway. But it was the bit in between I really enjoyed, this kind of survivalist tale. I knew the basics of the story, but not enough that it was spoiled at all. And I just, I really enjoyed it. I was very pleasantly surprised. In at number four, we have The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill. So I'd read The Woman in Black and enjoyed that as well. I'd seen the movie first, unfortunately. With this one, I don't know if there is a movie, but if there is, I haven't seen it. And this is very reminiscent of The Woman in Black. It has these same vibes, this same kind of plot, or the same basic plot of this sort of young man investigating the past that's kind of wants to stay buried and there's all this haunting kind of stuff there's uh, this ghostly kid which everyone knows ghostly kids are freaky i have a bit of a fear of mirrors as well now i have heard from a couple of friends who independently met susan hill and both of them said they didn't really get on with her very well so that kind of put me off reading it for a while for some reason but it shouldn't have it was a great book really enjoyed it and uh, yeah if you like sort of sinister horror You'll, you'll like this. Okay, at number three, we have Isaac Asimov, Space Ranger. And this is the first book about uh, David Starr, I believe he then gets the nickname, like, Lucky Star. And weirdly, I've read the last book in this series, book number six, The Rings of Saturn. And uh, I did enjoy it. I, I think you probably can read them all as standalones. In this one, it was very much like the building up of, um, of, of his myth, I suppose. And in it, he, he goes along to um, this uh, like this farm on Mars where there's been problems and basically Martian food keeps randomly killing people and so the Earth doesn't know if it can trust food coming from Mars but at the same time there's overpopulation and they need the food. It's actually remarkably forward looking considering it was written in 1953 or whatever it was. Let's look at the copyright date. 1952. And I also think actually there's, uh, yeah, there's an author's note here from 1970. And he says, I'm going to read this bit out to you. These stories were first published some time ago and the description of the surface of Mars and of its atmosphere was in accordance with astronomical beliefs of the period. Since then, however, astronomical knowledge of the inner solar system has advanced enormously because of the use of radar beams and of rockets. On November 28, 1964, the space probe known as Mariner 4 was launched in the direction of Mars. On July 15, 1965, Mariner 4 edged past Mars at a distance of little more than 6,000 miles, recorded observations and took photographs that were radioed back to Earth. I just think, what would this man have made of the world we live in today, you know? In at number two, we have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I don't know how it took me so long to get to reading this. I've read Plath's poetry before, really loved her stuff, always been on the lookout for this in charity shops and stuff, but just never seen a copy of it. And so when I finally did spot a copy of it, I just had to had to uh, get it. In fact, I didn't. I tell a lie. I bought this after uh, I uh, did some proofreading for a friend's uh, like job application, and in that they mentioned that this book was like one of their favourite books of all time. And I just sort of was like, right, I'm, I'm going to finally get it. I'm going to take it as a sign. And it's been described as like a feminist uh, catcher in the rye, and I can kind of see that. It's basically about a young woman who's dealing with like this, you know, the society of the 1950s, or at least I think it was the 50s. Um, but she's also struggling with mental health issues and like a hostile environment, all of this stuff. It's just really well written and as like a fellow mental health sufferer as well and kind of everyone knows how it ended with Plath, I just think it's a really important, valuable book and um, yeah, I'm glad I finally got to it. And finally, my top book of uh, Q1 is this one, the Backman books. No, that'd be cheating, there's four in this. Uh, specifically, The Long Walk by Richard Backman, uh, which is Stephen King's pseudonym. Basically, in The Long Walk, these kids volunteer to walk. They have to just keep on walking for as long as they can. There's a hundred of them, only one survivor at the end who then wins this prize money. It's all like televised, and it's like this sort of, almost this national sport in this dystopian government. Just really well written. It, it kind of investigates the motivations behind each of the characters for doing it. They all start to form these relationships, but at the same time, any one of them could die. I mean, literally, if you flag and slow down, then basically the army shoots you in the head after you've accumulated a certain number of warnings. It was really well done because as well, it kind of talked about people who'd worn the wrong footwear. And it really is like psychological and mental as well as physical. Just like imagine by the end of it, um, what it says here, a grueling 450 mile marathon. This is another thing that guy like, <laughs> like took me up on it. it's like well that's what the blurb of this says but yeah it's not a marathon or a specific distance you walk until there's only one of you left and uh yeah just just read it it's just mind-blowing 
So yeah, there are my top books of Q1 of 2019. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Let me know as well what your top books of the quarter were. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.